بسم الله نبدأ وبه نستعين ونصلي على الهادي الأمين نبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين In this presentation I will give a brief description about maxillofacial prosthesis with emphasis on the restoration of maxillary acquired defects. Maxillofacial prosthetic can be defined as the branch of prosthodontics concerned with the restoration of stomatognathic and associated facial structures that have been affected by disease, injury, or congenital defects. Who is the maxillofacial prosthodontist? Maxillofacial prosthetic is a subspecialty of prosthodontics where the doctor finished a three years residency program in prosthodontics. Then he spent an additional year in maxillofacial prosthetic program. He is involved in rehabs of defects or disabilities in the head and neck region, and he works cooperatively with various medical professions in a hospital setting. Maxillofacial prosthetic can be classified into two main categories. The first is intraoral defects, which can be congenital or acquired. The second is extraoral defects, which can be caused by trauma, tumor, and burns. And the third category is miscellaneous defects, which can be replacement in any part of the body. Treatment related to maxillofacial prosthetic include facial replacements, cranial implants, somatic prosthesis, radiation shields, obturators, palatal lift prosthesis, and mandibular resection prosthesis. The objectives and ultimate goal of maxillofacial rehabilitation include restoration of aesthetic, restoration of function, and the psychological well-being of the patient. And the ultimate goal is to enhance the quality of life within six months to one year. Defects in the heart palate will cause hypernasality in speech, leakage of liquids and food, impaired mastication, and cosmetic deformity. Prosthetic rehabilitation is very successful and highly predictable. In this lecture, I will cover the etiology of maxillary defects. Clinical examples and diagnostic signs will be shown. After that, I will speak about the surgical reconstruction versus the prosthetic rehabilitation. Then I will discuss the phases of treatment with the different types of prosthetic appliances. At the end of the lecture, I will show step by step how to fabricate the obturators. Tumors are the main cause of maxillary defects, especially squamous cell carcinoma, salivary gland tumors, and mesenchymal tumors. Trauma from sports and firearm injury comes next. Fungal infections and some drugs and drug abuse may induce also maxillary defects. This slide shows an example of squamous carcinomas arising from the paranasal sinuses. Because there is no pain before ulceration, patients think that this is a lesion caused by periodontal abscess or trauma from denture. These are another two examples of squamous carcinomas arising from the paranasal sinuses. The swelling only brought the attention of the patient to the disease. In this case, swelling of the cheek and eye region brought the attention of the patient to the tumor. Squamous carcinomas arising from the palatal mucosa. These tumors tend to stay localized. Now we will move to salivary gland tumors. Benign salivary gland tumors, like polymorphic adenoma, may transfer to malignant one if left untreated. Most of these tumors arise from the minor salivary gland at the junction of the hard and soft palate, and they tend to stay localized. The adenoid cystic carcinoma is a malignant type of salivary gland tumors. The submandibular salivary gland is the common site 
although it is slow growing, but locally it can be very aggressive. Mucoepidermoid carcinomas are the most common salivary gland tumors. 85% of the cases arise from the parotid gland. Mesenchymal sarcomas of the head and neck area are relatively uncommon. It arises from elsewhere in the body and it is highly malignant. Traumatic injuries and avulsive wound are difficult to restore. The defect varies considerably and is dependent on the nature of the injury. Often it will cause improper jaw relationship. Trauma-induced defects such as self-inflicted gunshots are irregular in shape and size. The soft tissue is heavily scarred and is difficult to treat. Cocaine sniffing may cause local ischemic necrosis which will induce serious palatal perforation. If surgical closure fails, prosthetic obturation can be a very successful solution. Maxillary necrosis may happen due to infections like myocarmycosis and aspergillosis. This type of infection may affect patients with uncontrolled diabetes and immunosuppressed patients. In myocarmycosis and aspergillosis, treatment requires extensive resection combined with systemic antifungal therapy. Bisphosphonate therapy are a group of medicine used to prevent bone loss and treat diseases like multiple myeloma, breast carcinoma, osteoporosis, Baguette disease, and primary hyperparathyroidism. This medicine inhibits osteoclastic activity and reduces the risk of bone fractures. However, it predisposes to osteonecrosis with significant number affecting the maxilla and causing maxillary defect. Surgical resection requires the removal of tumor along with the margins of normal tissues, either by palatectomy or radical maxillectomy. Palatectomy usually is performed to resect benign tumors. These two cases are typical defects secondary to palatectomy one for dentulous case and another for a dentulous patient. Radical maxillectomy is usually performed to resect malignant tumors depending on the extent of the tumor. The resection involves heart palate, maxillary sinus, orbital rim, half of the maxilla, and trigoid plates, and sometimes eye excentration and total nasal resection will be performed. To cover the sensitive respiratory epithelium and improve wound cleansability, a split thickness graft has to be done. The green arrow shows the border of the skin graft lining the defect. A split thickness graft is better than full thickness graft because it revascularizes more easily. The red arrow delineates the scar band formed at the junction with the oral mucosa. This band will help the obturator to retain much better. The black arrow shows the medial aspect of the nose that must be left open to allow for breathing. Post-resection reconstruction surgical closure. For small defects, it can be closed surgically without distorting the palatal contour. Large defects are best restored prosthetically. However, some surgeons prefer to close the defect surgically with vascularized free grafts. This type of surgical reconstruction will cause mucus accumulation and bad odor. In addition to that, the retention of the removable appliance will be compromised. Orthodontic therapy for patients with acquired surgical defects in the maxilla can be divided into three phases of treatment each having different objective. The initial phase called surgical obturation. The second phase called post-surgical interim obturation 
and the third phase called definitive obturation. Surgical obturators has some benefits. It provides a matrix for surgical packing, reduces contamination of the surgical wound, and enables a relatively normal speech. Other advantages of surgical obturator, it permits deglutition post-operatively, lessens the psychological impact of the surgery, and reduces the period of hospitalization. Surgical obturators necessitate advanced pre-planning with the surgeon, the patient, and the prosthodontist. It starts by taking a preliminary impression before the resection. After pouring stone cast, the surgeon needs to outline the planned resection site. The prosthodontist will knock out the teeth in the cast and trim the stone on the palatal area as outlined by the surgeon. This slide shows one of the techniques of fabricating immediate surgical obturators. The immediate surgical obturator simply is an acrylic template with plastic teeth in the majority of cases. It can be also fabricated without any teeth. During the surgical resection appointment and after placing the skin graft lining, the immediate surgical obturator will be wired to the alveolar ridge or relined with the soft liners like viscogel, which is a great material for obturators. Retention of obturators can be achieved by self-tapping fixation screw through a mid-plate hole or by suturing the flanges to the lip and to the cheek. Ten days after the resection surgery, the immediate surgical obturator and feeding tube will be removed and the wound has to be cleaned. The wound will shrink until it gets stabilized after four months and up to one year, depending on the wound size. During the healing phase of the defect, a transitional interim obturator will be prepared and given to the patient. The transitional obturator can be fabricated with and without teeth depending on the patient's needs and desires. The construction of definitive obturator may be considered four to six months after surgical resection. The timing depends on the size of the defect, progress of healing, and the prognosis of the tumor. The retention of definitive obturators depends on the number of teeth present and their location, the size and configuration of the defect, and the presence of dental implants. The retention of definitive obturators comes from engaging the scar band between the oral cavity and the skin graft lining at the lateral wall of the defect. Medially, the nasal mucosa is very sensitive and it should be avoided. To prevent mobility of teeth in the area adjacent to the defect, it is recommended during the surgery to have a mid-socket resection. This will preserve the bone around the remaining tooth adjacent to the defect. The presence of teeth enhance the prosthetic prognosis. Effort should be made to maintain its longevity. In some cases, teeth adjacent to the defect should be splinted together, and surveyed crown should be used with exaggerated wrist seats. To achieve better retention and stability, Whenever possible, it is highly recommended to avoid crossing the midline by leaving more anterior teeth and at least one molar in the back. Definitive obturator in edentulous patients can be retained successfully by dental implants. To maximize longevity, the implant should be splinted with header bar or dulder bar. Bar and clip attachment mechanism is better than ball or studs. To minimize the stresses to the fixtures, resilient extracoronal attachments like ERA is highly recommended. The weight of the definitive obturator can be reduced by 30% at 
by hollowing out the bulb of the obturator. The bulb of the obturator can be left open or closed by a lid. Open obturator will lead to food and mucus accumulation inside the bulb. Sectional obturators can be utilized with deep defects. The segments are retained by magnets. However, the denture retention and stability will be affected. On the remaining part of this lecture, I will present the prosthetic technique step by step for both dentulous and edentulous patients. The first step in fabricating a definitive obturator is to register with a preliminary alginate temperature material using a perforated edentulous tray. This tray should be molded by periphery wax and the small defect should be plugged with gauze mixed with Vaseline to prevent locking the impression material inside the defect. The master impression is registered using custom tray. On the primary cast, medial, anterior, and posterior undercut must be blocked out, and the lateral wall undercut should be left as it is. The fabricated custom tray should have maximum extension laterally, minimal extension medially, and slightly overextended posteriorly. Border molding the custom tray should be done using low fusing compounds. This type of material will provide more working time and allow functional movement to register the posterior edges. Master impressions can be registered using light body polysulfide because of its long working time, viscosity, and flow. Also, it doesn't tear during removal. Overall, it will give great accuracy and fine definition. It is important that the master impression must be boxed because it will preserve the peripheral roll, provide protective landmark, and produce dense cast to permit flasking. The master cast should be poured by vacuum mixed yellowstone. Pouring should start from the defect side, then we should wait for one hour before immersing into hot water for five minutes to soften the compound before separating the cast from the impression. Centric relation can be registered by using rigid record bases and soft wax rims. It is important to apply denture adhesive at the non-resected side to secure the retention. Minimal block out should be used for the lateral wall of the defects. Vertical dimension of occlusion can be registered using the usual methods for determining the proper VDO. Reducing the VDO can be done with severe post-radiation telismus patients. Centric relation record is difficult to obtain due to the instability of record bases at the defect side. Therefore, it is preferred to use soft wax rim and silicone as a registration material. Furthermore, to accommodate the upper cast, use an articulator that can be adjusted on the post to accept the large cast. With definitive obturators, Teeth are arranged according to the neutricentric concept of occlusion. This concept minimizes lateral forces and deflective contacts. Wax can be added over the canine on the defect side to push the lip and create better aesthetic results. On the delivery appointment, pressure indicating paste is painted generously to reveal the excessive tissue displacement. This step should be repeated at least three times. Finally, the completed obturator should be highly polished with fine pumice, especially in the undercut areas on the posterior and lateral walls, and post-operative instruction should be given to the patient. Thank you for listening with my best wishes.